Section 1 of Amoretti, a sonnet sequence by Edmund Spencer. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. Sonnets 1, 2, and 3. Sonnet 1 happy ye leaves when as those lily hands which hold my life in their dead doing might shall handle you and hold in love soft bands like captives trembling at the victor's sight and happy lines on which with starry light those lamping eyes will deign sometimes to look and read the sorrows of my dying sprite written with tears in heart's close bleeding book and happy rhymes bathed in the sacred brook of helicon whence she derived is when ye behold that angel's blessed look my soul's long lacked food my heaven's bliss leaves lines and rhymes seek her to please alone whom if ye please i care for other none Sonnet two. Unquiet thought, whom at the first I bred of inward bale of my love pined heart, and Scythians have with sighs and sorrows fed, till greater than my womb thou walks an art. Break forth at length out of the inner part in which thou lurkest like to vipers brood, and seek some succour both to ease my smart and also to sustain thyself with food but if in presence of that fairest proud thou chance to come fall lowly at her feet and with meek humbless and afflicted mood pardon for thee and grace for me entreat which if she grant then live and my love cherish if not die soon and I with thee will perish. Sonnet three. Thou sovereign beauty which I do admire, witness the world how worthy to be praised. The light whereof hath kindled heavenly fire in my frail spirit by her from baseness raised. That being now with her huge brightness dazed, base things i can no more endure to view but looking still on her i stand amazed at wondrous sight of so celestial hue so when my tongue would speak her praises due it stopped is with thought's astonishment and when my pen would write her titles true it ravished is with fancy's wonderment yet in my heart i then both speak and write the wonder that my wit cannot indite end of section one of amoretti by edmund spencer recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio section two of amoretti by edmund spencer this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets 4, 5, and 6. Sonnet 4. New year forth looking out of Janus' gate does seem to promise hope of new delight, and bidding the old adieu, his passed date bids all old thoughts to die in dumpish sprite, and calling forth out of sad winter's night fresh love that long hath slept in cheerless bower wills him awake and soon about him dight his wanton wings and darts of deadly power for lusty spring now in his timely hour is ready to come forth him to receive and warns the earth with divers colored flower to deck herself and her fair mantle weave then you fair flower in whom fresh youth doth reign Prepare yourself new love to entertain. 
Sonnet 5. Rudely thou wrongest my dear heart's desire in finding fault with her too portly pride. The thing which I do most in her admire is of the world unworthy most envied. For in those lofty looks is close implied scorn of base things and sedain of foul dishonor, threatening rash eyes which gaze on her so wide that loosely they ne'er dare to look upon her. Such pride is praise, such portliness is honor, that boldened innocence bears in her eyes, and her fair countenance, like a goodly banner, spreads in defiance of all enemies. Was never in this world aught worthy tried without some spark of such self-pleasing pride? Sonnet 6. Be not dismayed that her unmoved mind doth still persist in her rebellious pride, and love not like to lusts of baser kind, the harder one, the firmer will abide. The dureful oak, whose sap is not yet dried, is long ere it conceive the kindling fire, but when it once doth burn, it doth divide great heat and makes his flames to heaven aspire. So hard it is to kindle new desire in gentle breast that shall endure forever. Deep is the wound that dents the parts entire with chaste effects that naught but death can sever. Then think not long in taking little pain to knit the knot that ever shall remain. End of section two of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Section three of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets number seven, eight, and nine. Sonnet 7 Fair eyes, the mirror of my mazed heart, what wondrous virtue is contained in you, the which both life and death forth from you dart into the object of your mighty view. For when ye mildly look with lovely hue, then is my soul with life and love inspired. But when ye lower or look on me askew, then do I die as one with lightning fired. But since that life is more than death desired, look ever lovely as becomes you best, that your bright beams of my weak eyes admired may kindle living fire within my breast. Such life should be the honor of your light, such death the sad ensample of your might. Sonnet 8 More than most fair, full of the living fire, Kindled above unto the Maker near, No eyes but joys in which all powers conspire, That to the world naught else be counted dear. Through your bright beams doth not the blinded guest Shoot out his darts to base affection's wound? But angels come to lead frail minds to rest in chaste desires on heavenly beauty bound. You frame my thoughts and fashion me within. You stop my tongue and teach my heart to speak. You calm the storm that passion did begin, strong through your cause, but by your virtue weak. Dark is the world where your light shined never. Well is he born that may behold you ever. Sonnet 9 Long while I sought to what I might compare Those powerful eyes which lighten my dark sprite. Yet find I naught on earth to which I dare Resemble the image of their goodly light. Not to the sun, 
for they do shine by night nor to the moon for they are changed never nor to the stars for they have purer sight nor to the fire for they consume not ever nor to the lightning for they still persever nor to the diamond for they are more tender nor unto crystal for naught may them sever nor unto glass such baseness might offend her then to the maker self they likest be whose light doth lighten all that here we see end of section three of amoretti by edmund spencer recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio section four of amoretti by edmund spencer this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets 10, 11, and 12. Sonnet 10. Unrighteous Lord of love, what law is this that me thou makest thus tormented be, the while she lordeth in licentious bliss of her free will, scorning both thee and me? see how the tyranness doth joy to see the huge massacres which her eyes do make and humbled heart springs captives unto thee that thou of them mayest mighty vengeance take but her proud heart do thou a little shake and that high look with which she doth control all this world's pride bow to a baser make and all her faults in thy black book enroll that i may laugh at her in equal sort as she doth laugh at me and makes my pain her sport sonnet eleven daily when i do seek and sue for peace and hostages do offer for my truth she cruel warrior doth herself address to battle and the weary war reneweth nor will be moved with reason or with ruth to grant small respite to my restless toil but greedily her fell intent pursueth of my poor life to make unpitied spoil yet my poor life all sorrows to a soil i would her yield her wrath to pacify but then she seeks with torment and turmoil to force me live and will not let me die all pain hath end and every war hath peace but mine no price nor prayer may surcease sonnet twelve one day i sought with her heart-thrilling eyes to make a truce and terms to entertain all fearless then of so false enemies which sought me to entrap in treason's train so as i then disarmed did remain a wicked ambush which lay hidden long in the close court of her guileful iron thence breaking forth did thick about me throng too feeble i to abide the brunt so strong was forced to yield myself into their hands who me captiving straight with rigorous wrong have ever since me kept in cruel bands so lady now to you i do complain against your eyes that justice i may gain end of section four of amoretti by edmund spencer Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Section 5 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets 13, 14, and 15. Sonnet 13 in that proud port which her so goodly graceth 
whilst her fair face she rears up to the sky and to the ground her eyelids low embaseth most goodly temperature ye may descry mild humbless mixed with awful majesty for looking on the earth when she was born her mind remembereth her mortality whatso is fairest shall to earth return but that same lofty countenance seems to scorn base thing and think how she to heaven may climb treading down earth as loathsome and forlorn that hinders heavenly thoughts with drossy slime yet lowly still vouchsafe to look on me such lowliness shall make you lofty be sonnet fourteen return again my forces late dismayed unto the siege by you abandoned quite great shame it is to leave like one afraid so fair a peace for one repulse so light gainst such strong castles needeth greater might than those small forts which ye were wont belay such haughty minds inured to hardy fight disdain to yield unto the first assay bring therefore all the forces that ye may and lay incessant battery to her heart plaints prayers vows ruth sorrow and dismay those engines can the proudest love convert and if those fail fall down and die before her so dying live and living do adore her Sonnet 15. Ye tradeful merchants that with weary toil do seek most precious things to make your gain, and both the Indias of their treasures spoil, what needeth you to seek so far in vain? For lo, my love doth in herself contain all this world's riches that may far be found. If sapphires, lo, her eyes be sapphires plain if rubies lo her lips be rubies sound if pearls her teeth be pearls both pure and round if ivory her forehead ivory ween if gold her locks are finest gold on ground if silver her fair hands are silver sheen but that which fairest is but few behold her mind adorned with virtues manifold. End of section five of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Section six of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets 16, 17, and 18. Sonnet 16. One day, as I unwarily did gaze on those fair eyes by love's immortal light, the whiles my astonished heart stood in amaze through sweet illusion of her look's delight. I might perceive how in her glancing sight legions of loves with little wings did fly darting their deadly arrows fiery bright at every rash beholder passing by one of those archers closely i did spy aiming his arrow at my very heart when suddenly with twinkle of her eye the damsel broke his misintended dart had she not so done sure i had been slain yet as it was, I hardly scaped with pain. Sonnet 17 The glorious portrait of that angel's face Made to amaze weak men's confused skill And this world's worthless glory to embase. What pen, what pencil can express her fill? For though he colors could devise at will, and eke his learned hand at pleasure guide, 
least trembling it his workmanship should spill yet many wondrous things there are beside the sweet eye glances that like arrows glide the charming smiles that rob sense from the heart the lovely pleasance and the lofty pride cannot express it be by any art a greater craftsman's hand thereto doth need that can express the life of things indeed sonnet eighteen the rolling wheel that runneth often round the hardest steel in tract of time doth tear and drizzling drops that often do redound the firmest flint doth in continuance wear yet cannot i with many a dropping tear and long entreaty soften her hard heart that she will once vouchsafe my plaint to hear or look with pity on my painful smart but when i plead she bids me play my part and when i weep she says tears are but water and when i sigh she says i know the art and when i wail she turns herself to laughter so do i weep and wail and plead in vain while she as steel and flint doth still remain end of section six of amoretti by edmund spencer recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio Section 7 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets 19, 20, and 21. Sonnet 19. The merry cuckoo, messenger of spring, his trumpet shrill hath thrice already sounded, that warns all lovers wait upon their king who now is coming forth with garland crowned with noise whereof the choir of birds resounded their anthem sweet devised of love's praise that all the woods their echoes back rebounded as if they knew the meaning of their lays but amongst them all which did love's honour raise no word was heard of her that most it ought but she his precept proudly disobeys and doth his idle message set at naught therefore o love unless she turn to thee ere cuckoo end let her a rebel be sonnet twenty in vain i seek and sue to her for grace and do mine humbled heart before her poor the whiles her foot she in my neck doth place and tread my life down in the lowly floor and yet the lion that is lord of power and reigneth over every beast in field in his most pride disdaineth to devour the silly lamb that to his might doth yield but she more cruel and more savage wild than either lion or lioness shames not to be with guiltless blood defiled but taketh glory in her cruelness fairer than fairest let none ever say that ye were blooded in a yielded prey sonnet twenty one was it the work of nature or of art which tempered so the feature of her face that pride and meekness mixed by equal part do both appear to adorn her beauty's grace for with mild pleasance which doth pride displace she to her love doth lookers eyes allure and with stern countenance back again doth chase their looser looks that stir up lusts impure with such strange terms her eyes she doth endure that with one look she doth my life dismay and with another doth it straight recure her smile me draws her frown me drives away thus doth she train and teach me with her looks 
such art of eyes I never read in books. End of section 7 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Section 8 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets 22, 23, and 24. Sonnet 22. This holy season fit to fast and pray, men to devotion ought to be inclined. Therefore, I likewise on so holy day, for my sweet saint, some service fit will find. Her temple fair is built within my mind, in which her glorious image placed is, on which my thoughts do day and night attend, like sacred priests that never think amiss. There I, to her as the author of my bliss, will build an altar to appease her ire, and on the same my heart will sacrifice, burning in flames of pure and chaste desire. The which vouchsafe, O goddess, to accept amongst thy dearest relics to be kept. Sonnet 23 Penelope, for her Ulysses' sake, devised a web her wooers to deceive, in which the work that she all day did make, the same at night she did again unreave. Such subtle craft my damsel doth conceive, the importune suit of my desire to shun. For all that I in many days do weave, in one short hour I find by her undone. So when I think to end that I begun, I must begin and never bring to end, for with one look she spills that long I spun, and with one word my whole year's work doth rend. Such labor like the spider's web I find, whose fruitless work is broken with least wind. Sonnet 24 When I behold that beauty's wonderment and rare perfection of each goodly part, of nature's skill the only compliment, I honor and admire the maker's art. But when I feel the bitter baleful smart which her fair eyes unwares do work in me, that death out of their shiny beams do dart, I think that I a new Pandora see, whom all the gods in council did agree into this sinful world from heaven to send, that she to wicked men a scourge should be for all their faults with which they did offend. But since ye are my scourge, I will entreat that for my faults ye will me gently beat. End of section 8 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio Section 9 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets 25, 26, and 27. Sonnet 25. How long shall this like dying life endure, and know no end of her own mystery, but waste and wear away in terms unsure, twixt fear and hope depending doubtfully? Yet better were it once to let me die and show the last ensample of your pride than to torment me thus with cruelty to prove your power, which I too well have tried. But yet, if in your hardened breast ye hide a close intent at last to show me grace, 
then all the woes and wrecks which i abide as means of bliss i gladly will embrace and wish that more and greater they might be that greater meed at last may turn to me sonnet twenty six sweet is the rose but grows upon a briar sweet is the juniper but sharp his bough sweet is the eglantine but pricketh near sweet is the fir bloom but his branches rough sweet is the cypress but his rind is tough sweet is the nut but bitter is his pill sweet is the broom flower but yet sour enough and sweet is moly but his root is ill so every sweet with sour is tempered still that maketh it be coveted the more for easy things that may be got at will most sorts of men do set but little store why then should i account of little pain that endless pleasure shall unto me gain sonnet twenty seven fair proud now tell me why should fair be proud sith all world's glory is but dross unclean and in the shade of death itself shall shroud however now thereof ye little ween that goodly idol now so gay be seen shall doff her flesh's borrowed fair attire and be forgot as it had never been that many now much worship and admire ne any then shall after it inquire ne any mention shall thereof remain but what this verse that never shall expire shall to you purchase with her thankless pain fair be no longer proud of that shall perish but that which shall you make immortal cherish End of section nine of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Section ten of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets twenty eight, twenty nine, and thirty. Sonnet. 28. The laurel leaf, which you this day do wear, gives me great hope of your relenting mind. For since it is the badge which I do bear, ye wearing it do seem to me inclined. The power thereof, which oft in me I find, let it likewise your gentle breast inspire with sweet infusion, and put you in mind of that proud maid whom now those leaves attire proud daphne scorning phoebus lovely fire on the thessalian shore from him did fly for which the gods in their revengeful ire did her transform into a laurel tree then fly no more fair love from phoebus chase but in your breast his leaf and love embrace Sonnet twenty nine. See how the stubborn damsel doth deprave my simple meaning with disdainful scorn, and by the bay which I unto her gave accounts myself her captive quite forlorn. The bay, quoth she, is of the victors born, yielded them by the vanquished as their meads, and they therewith do poets' heads adorn to sing the glory of their famous deeds but sith she will the conquest challenge deeds let her accept me as her faithful thrall that her great triumph which my skill exceeds i may in trump of fame blaze over all then would i deck her head with glorious bays and fill the world with her victorious praise Sonnet thirty. 
My love is like to ice, and I to fire. How comes it, then, that this her cold so great is not dissolved through my so hot desire, but harder grows the more I her entreat? Or how comes it that my exceeding heat is not delayed by her heart frozen cold, but that I burn much more in boiling sweat and feel my flames augmented manifold? What more miraculous thing may be told that fire, which all things melts, should harden ice, and ice which is congealed with senseless cold should kindle fire by wonderful device? Such is the power of love in gentle mind, that it can alter all the course of kind. End of section 10 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Section 11 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets 31, 32, and 33. Sonnet 31. Ah, why hath nature to so hard a heart given so goodly gifts of beauty's grace, whose pride depraves each other better part, and all those precious ornaments deface? Sith to all other beasts of bloody race a dreadful countenance she given hath, that with their terror all the rest may chase, and warn to shun the danger of their wrath. But my proud one doth work the greater scath through sweet allurement of her lovely hue, that she the better may in bloody bath of such poor thralls her cruel hands embrew. But did she know how ill these two accord, such cruelty she would have soon abhorred. Sonnet 32 the painful smith, with force of fervent heat, the hardest iron soon doth mollify, that with his heavy sledge he can it beat, and fashion to what he it list apply. Yet cannot all these flames in which I fry her heart more hard than iron, soft of wit, ne all the plaints and prayers with which I do beat on the anvil of her stubborn wit, but still. The more she fervent sees my fit, the more she freezeth in her willful pride, and harder grows the harder she is smit with all the plaints which to her be applied. What then remains but I to ashes burn, and she to stones at length all frozen turn? Sonnet 33 Great wrong I do. I can it not deny to that most sacred empress, my dear dread, not finishing her queen of fairy, that mote enlarge her living praises dead. But, Lodwick, this of grace to be a read, do ye not think the accomplishment of it sufficient work for one man's simple head, all were it as the rest but rudely writ? How then should I, without another wit, think ever to endure so tedious toil, since that this one is tossed with troublous fit of a proud love that doth my spirit spoil? Cease then till she vouchsafe to grant me rest, or lend you me another living breast. End of section 11 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Section 12 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets 34, 35, and 36. Sonnet 34. 
like a ship that through the ocean wide by conduct of some star doth make her way when as a storm hath dimmed her trusty guide out of her course doth wander far astray so i whose star that wont with her bright ray me to direct with clouds is overcast do wander now in darkness and dismay through hidden perils round about me plast yet hope i well that when this storm is past my halo say the lodestar of my life will shine again and look on me at last with lovely light to clear my cloudy grief till then i wander careful comfortless in secret sorrow and sad pensiveness sonnet thirty five my hungry eyes through greedy covetise still to behold the object of their pain with no contentment can themselves suffice but having pine and having not complain for lacking it they cannot life sustain and having it they gaze on it the more in their amazement like narcissus vain whose eyes him starved so plenty makes me poor yet are mine eyes so filled with the store of that fair sight that nothing else they brook but loathe the things which they did like before and can no more endure on them to look all this world's glory seemeth vain to me and all their shows but shadows saving she sonnet thirty six tell me when shall these weary woes have end or shall their ruthless torment never cease but all my days in pining languor spend without hope of assuagement or release is there no means for me to purchase peace or make agreement with her thrilling eyes but that their cruelty doth still increase and daily more augment my miseries but when ye have showed all extremities then think how little glory ye have gained by slaying him whose life though ye despise mote have your life in honour long maintained but by his death which some perhaps will moan ye shall condemned be of many a one End of section 12 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Section 13 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets number 37, 38, and 39. Sonnet 37 What guile is this, that those her golden tresses She doth attire under a net of gold, And with sly skill so cunningly them dresses, That which is gold or hair may scarce be told? Is it that men's frail eyes, which gaze too bold, She may entangle in that golden snare? and being caught may craftily enfold their weaker hearts which are not well aware take heed therefore mine eyes how ye do stare henceforth too rashly on that guileful net in which if ever ye entrapped are out of her bands ye by no means shall get fondness it were for any being free to covet fetters though they golden be sonnet thirty eight orion when through tempest's cruel rack he forth was thrown into the greedy seas through the sweet music which his harp did make allured a dolphin him from death to ease 
but my rude music which was wont to please some dainty ears cannot with any skill the dreadful tempest of her wrath appease nor move the dolphin from her stubborn will but in her pride she doth persever still all careless how my life for her decays yet with one word she can it save or spill to spill were pity but to save were praise choose rather to be praised for doing good than to be blamed for spilling guiltless blood sonnet thirty nine sweet smile the daughter of the queen of love expressing all thy mother's powerful art with which she wants to temper angry jove when all the gods he threats with thundering dart sweet is thy virtue as thyself sweet art for when on me thou shinest late in sadness a melting pleasance ran through every part and me revived with heart-robbing gladness whilst wrapped with joy resembling heavenly madness my soul was ravished quite as in a trance and feeling thence no more her sorrow's sadness fed on the fullness of that cheerful glance more sweet than nectar or ambrosial meat seemed every bit which thenceforth i did eat End of section 13 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Section 14 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets 40, 41, and 42. Sonnet 40 Mark when she smiles with amiable cheer, And tell me, whereto can ye liken it? When on each eyelid sweetly do appear An hundred graces as in shade to sit. Likest it seemeth in my simple wit, Unto the fair sunshine in summer's day, That when a dreadful storm away is flit, through the broad world doth spread his goodly ray, at sight whereof each bird that sits on spray, and every beast that to his den was fled, comes forth afresh out of their late dismay, and to the light lift up their drooping head. So my storm-beaten heart likewise is cheered with that sunshine when cloudy looks are cleared. Sonnet 41 Is it her nature, or is it her will, To be so cruel to an humbled foe? If nature, then she may it mend with skill. If will, then she at will may will forego. But if her nature and her will be so, That she will plague the man that loves her most, and take delight to increase a wretch's woe, then all her nature's goodly gifts are lost, and that same glorious beauty's idle boast is but a bait such wretches to beguile, as being long in her love's tempest tossed, she means at last to make her piteous spoil. Of fairest fair let never it be named, that so fair beauty was so foully shamed. Sonnet 42 The love which me so cruelly tormenteth, so pleasing is in my extremest pain, that all the more my sorrow it augmenteth, the more I love and do embrace my bane. Ne'er do I wish, for wishing were but vain, to be acquit from my continual smart, but joy her thrall for ever to remain, and yield for pledge my poor captived heart. 
the witch that it from her may never start let her if please her bind with adamant chain and from all wandering loves which mote pervert his safe assurance strongly it restrain only let her abstain from cruelty and do me not before my time to die end of section 14 of amoretti by edmund spencer recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio section 15 of amoretti by edmund spencer this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by leonard wilson sonnets forty three forty four and forty five sonnet forty three shall i then silent be or shall i speak and if i speak her wrath renew i shall and if i silent be my heart will break or choke it be with overflowing gall what tyranny is this both my heart to thrall and eke my tongue with proud restraint to tie that neither i may speak nor think at all but like a stupid stock in silence die yet i my heart with silence secretly will teach to speak and my just cause to plead and eke mine eyes with meek humility love learned letters to her eyes to read which her deep wit that true heart's thought can spell will soon conceive and learn to construe well sonnet forty four when those renowned noble peers of greece through stubborn pride amongst themselves did jar forgetful of the famous golden fleece then orpheus with his harp their strife did bar but this continual cruel civil war the which myself against myself do make whilst my weak powers of passions worried are no skill can stent nor reason can aslake but when in hand my tuneless harp i take then do i more augment my foe's despite and grief renew and passions do awake to battle fresh against myself to fight mongst whom the more i seek to settle peace the more i find their malice to increase sonnet forty five leave lady in your glass of crystal clean your goodly self for evermore to view and in myself my inward self i mean most lively like behold your semblance true within my heart though hardly it can show things so divine to view of earthly eye the fair idea of your celestial hue and every part remains immortally and were it not that through your cruelty with sorrow dimmed and deformed it were the goodly image of your visnomy clearer than crystal would therein appear but if yourself in me ye plain will see remove the cause by which your fair beams darkened be end of section fifteen of amoretti by edmund spencer recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio section sixteen of amoretti by edmund spencer this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets 46, 47, and 48. Sonnet 46. When my abode's prefixed time is spent, my cruel fare straight bids me wend my way. But then from heaven most hideous storms are sent, as willing me against her will to stay whom then shall i or heaven or her obey 
the heavens know best what is the best for me but as she will whose will my life does sway my lower heaven so it perforce must be but ye high heavens that all this sorrow see sith all your tempests cannot hold me back assuage your storms or else both you and she will both together me too sorely rack enough it is for one man to sustain the storms which she alone on me doth rain sonnet forty seven trust not the treason of those smiling looks until you have their guileful trains well tried for they are like but unto golden hooks that from the foolish fish their baits do hide so she with flattering smiles weak hearts doth guide unto her love and tempt to their decay whom being caught she kills with cruel pride and feeds at pleasure on the wretched prey yet even whilst her bloody hands them slay her eyes look lovely and upon them smile that they take pleasure in her cruel play and dying do themselves of pain beguile o mighty charm which makes men love their bane and think they die with pleasure live with pain sonnet forty eight innocent paper whom too cruel hand did make the matter to avenge her ire and ere she could thy cause well understand did sacrifice unto the greedy fire well worthy thou to have found better hire than so bad end for heretics ordained yet heresy nor treason didst conspire but plead thy master's cause unjustly pained whom she all careless of his grief constrained to utter forth the anguish of his heart and would not hear when he to her complained the piteous passion of his dying smart yet live for ever though against her will and speak her good though she requite it ill end of section sixteen of amoretti by edmund spencer Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Section 17 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets 49, 50, and 51. Sonnet 49. Fair cruel, why are you so fierce and cruel? Is it because your eyes have power to kill? Then know that mercy is the mightiest jewel, and greater glory think to save than spill. But if it be your pleasure and proud will to show the power of your imperious eyes, then not on him that never thought you ill but bend your force against your enemies let them feel the utmost of your cruelties and kill with looks as cockatrices do but him that at your footstool humbled lies with merciful regard give mercy to such mercy shall you make admired to be so shall you live by giving life to me Sonnet 50 Long languishing in double malady Of my heart's wound and of my body's grief, There came to me a leech That would apply fit medicines For my body's best relief. Vain man, quoth I, that hast but little brief In deep discovery of the mind's disease, Is not the heart of all the body chief? and rules the members as itself doth please then with some cordial seek first to appease the inward languor of my wounded heart and then my body shall have shortly ease 
But such sweet cordials pass physician's art. Then my life's leech do you your skill reveal, And with one salve both heart and body heal. Sonnet 51 Do I not see that fairest images Of hardest marble are of purpose made? For that they should endure through many ages, Ne'er let their famous monuments to fade. Why then do I, untrained in lover's trade, Her hardness blame, which I should more commend? Sith never aught was excellent essayed, Which was not hard to achieve and bring to end. Ne'er aught so hard, but he that would attend, Both soften it, and to his will allure. So do I hope her stubborn heart to bend, And that it then more steadfast will endure. Only my pains will be the more to get her, But having her, my joy will be the greater. End of section 17 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio Section 18 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson Sonnets 52, 53, and 54 Sonnet 52 so oft as homeward I from her depart, I go like one that, having lost the field, Is prisoner led away with heavy heart, Despoiled of warlike arms and knowing shield. So do I now myself a prisoner yield To sorrow and to solitary pain. From presence of my dearest dear exiled, Long while alone in languor to remain. There let no thought of joy or pleasure vain Dare to approach that may my solace breed, But sudden dumps and dreary sad disdain Of all the world's gladness more my torment feed. So I her absence will my penance make, That of her presence I my meed may take. Sonnet 53 The panther, knowing that his spotted hide Doth please all beasts, but that his looks them fray, Within a bush his dreadful head doth hide, To let them gaze, whilst he on them may prey. Right so my cruel fare with me doth play, For with the goodly semblance of her hue She doth allure me to mine own decay and then no mercy will unto me show. Great shame it is, things so divine in view, made for to be the world's most ornament, to make the bait her gazers to embrew, good shames to be so ill an instrument. But mercy doth with beauty best agree, as in their maker ye them best may see. Sonnet 54 Of this world's theatre in which we stay, My love, like the spectator, idly sits, Beholding me that all the pageants play, Disguising diversely my troubled wits. Sometimes I joy when glad occasion fits, And a mask in mirth like to a comedy. Soon after, when my joy to sorrow flits, I wail and make my woes a tragedy. Yet she, beholding me with constant eye, Delights not in my mirth, nor ruse my smart, But when I laugh she mocks, and when I cry she laughs, And hardens evermore her heart. What then can move her, if nor mirth nor moan, she is no woman but a senseless stone. End of section 18 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer.
Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Section 19 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets number 55, 56, and 57. Sonnet 55. So oft as I her beauty do behold, and therewith do her cruelty compare, I marvel of what substance was the mould the which her made at once so cruel fair. Not earth, for her high thoughts more heavenly are. Not water, for her love doth burn like fire. Not air, for she is not so light or rare. Not fire, for she doth freeze with faint desire. Then needs another element inquire, Whereof she mote be made. That is, the sky. For to the heaven her haughty looks aspire, And eke her mind is pure immortal high. Then saith to heaven ye likened are the best, Be like in mercy as in all the rest. Sonnet 56 Fair ye be sure, but cruel and unkind, as is a tiger that with greediness hunts after blood, when he by chance doth find a feeble beast that fellly him oppress. Fair be ye sure, but proud and pitiless, as is a storm that all things doth prostrate, finding a tree alone all comfortless, beats on it strongly it to ruinate. Fair be ye sure, but hard and obstinate, as is a rock amidst the raging floods, gainst which a ship of succor desolate doth suffer wreck both of herself and goods. That ship, that tree, and that same beast am I, whom ye do wreck, do ruin, and destroy. Sonnet 57 Sweet warrior, when shall I have peace with you? High time it is this war now ended were, which I no longer can endure to sue, ne your incessant battery more to bear. So weak my powers, so sore my wounds appear, That wonder is how I should live a jot, Seeing my heart through launched everywhere With thousand arrows which your eyes have shot. Yet shoot ye sharply still, and spare me not, But glory think to make these cruel stores. Ye cruel one, what glory can be got in slaying him that would live gladly yours. Make peace, therefore, and grant me timely grace that all my wounds will heal in little space. End of section 19 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Section 20 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets 58, 59, and 60. Sonnet 58. By her that is most assured to herself. Weak is the assurance that weak flesh reposeth in her own power, and scorneth others' aid that soonest falls when as she most supposeth herself assured, and is of naught afraid. All flesh is frail, and all her strength unstayed, like a vain bubble blown up with air. Devouring time and changeful chance have prayed her glory's pride that none may it repair. Now none so rich or wise, so strong or fair, but faileth trusting on his own assurance. And he that standeth on the highest stair 
falls lowest, for on earth naught hath endurance. Why then do ye, proud fair, misdeem so far that to yourself ye most assured are? Sonnet 59 Thrice happy she that is so well assured unto herself, and settled so in heart, that neither will for better be allured, ne feared with worse to any chance to start. But like a steady ship doth strongly part the raging waves, and keeps her course aright, ne aught for tempest doth from it depart, ne aught for fairer weather's false delight. Such self-assurance need not fear the spite of grudging foes, ne favour seek of friends. But in the stay of her own steadfast might, neither to one herself nor other bends. Most happy she that most assured doth rest, but he most happy who such one loves best. Sonnet 60 They that in course of heavenly spheres are skilled To every planet point his sundry year In which her circle's voyage is fulfilled As Mars in threescore years doth run his sphere So since the winged god his planet clear Began in me to move, one year is spent the which doth longer unto me appear than all those forty which my life outwent. Then by that count, which lovers' books invent, the sphere of Cupid forty years contains, which I have wasted in long languishment that seemed the longer for my greater pains. But let me love's fair planet short her ways this year ensuing, or else short my days. End of section 20 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Section 21 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets 61, 62, and 63. Sonnet 61. The glorious image of the Maker's beauty, my sovereign saint, the idol of my thought, dare not henceforth above the bounds of duty to accuse of pride or rashly blame for aught. For being as she is divinely wrought, and of the brood of angels heavenly born, and with the crew of blessed saints upbrought, each of which did her with their gifts adorn. The bud of joy, the blossom of the morn, the beam of light whom mortal eyes admire. What reason is it then but she should scorn base things that to her love too bold aspire? Such heavenly forms ought rather worshipped be than dare be loved by men of mean degree. Sonnet 62 The weary year his race now having run, the new begins his compassed course anew. With show of morning mild he hath begun, betokening peace and plenty to ensue. So let us, which this change of weather view, change eke our minds, and former lives amend. The old year's sins forepast, let us eschew, and fly the faults with which we did offend. Then shall the new year's joy forth freshly send into the glooming world his gladsome ray. And all these storms which now his beauty blend Shall turn to calms and timely clear away. So likewise, love, cheer you your heavy sprite And change old years' annoy to new delight. Sonnet 63 
after long storms and tempests sad assay which hardly i endured heretofore in dread of death and dangerous dismay with which my silly bark was tossed sore i do at length descry the happy shore in which i hope ere long for to arrive fair soil it seems from far and fraught with store of all that dear and dainty is alive most happy he that can at last achieve the joyous safety of so sweet a rest whose least delight sufficeth to deprive remembrance of all pains which him oppressed all pains are nothing in respect of this all sorrows short that gain eternal bliss end of section twenty one of amoretti by edmund spencer recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio section twenty two of amoretti by edmund spencer this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by leonard wilson sonnets sixty four sixty five and sixty six sonnet sixty four coming to kiss her lips such grace i found meseemed i smelled a garden of sweet flowers that dainty odors from them threw around for damsels fit to deck their lovers bowers her lips did smell like unto gillyflowers her ruddy cheeks like unto roses red her snowy brows like budded bellamores her lovely eyes like pinks but newly spread her goodly bosom like a strawberry bed her neck like to a bunch of columbines her breast like lilies ere their leaves be shed her nipples like young blossomed jasmines such fragrant flowers do give most odorous smell but her sweet odor did them all excel sonnet sixty five the doubt which you misdeem fair love is vain that fondly fear to lose your liberty when losing one two liberties you gain and make him bond that bondage erst did fly sweet be the bands the which true love doth tie without constraint or dread of any ill the gentle bird feels no captivity within her cage but sings and feeds her fill there pride dare not approach nor discord spill the league twixt them that loyal love hath bound but simple truth and mutual good will seeks with sweet peace to salve each other's wound there faith doth fearless dwell in brazen tower and spotless pleasure builds her sacred bower sonnet sixty six to all those happy blessings which ye have with plenteous hand by heaven upon you thrown this one disparagement they to you gave that ye your love lent to so mean a one yet whose high worth surpassing paragon could not on earth have found one fit for mate ne but in heaven matchable to none why did ye stoop unto so lowly state but ye thereby much greater glory gate than had ye sorted with the prince's peer for now your light doth more itself dilate and in my darkness greater doth appear yet since your light hath once illumined me with my reflex yours shall increased be End of section twenty two of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Section twenty three of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets 67, 68, and 69. Sonnet 67. Like as a huntsman, after weary chase, seeing the game from him escaped away, sits down to rest him in some shady place, with panting hounds beguiled of their prey. So, after long pursuit and vain assay, when I, all weary, had the chase forsook, the gentle deer returned the selfsame way, thinking to quench her thirst at the next brook. There she, beholding me with milder look, sought not to fly, but fearless still did bide, till I in hand her yet half-trembling took, and with her own good will her firmly tied. Strange thing me seemed to see a beast so wild, so goodly one, with her own will beguiled. Sonnet 68 Most glorious Lord of life, that on this day didst make thy triumph over death and sin, and having harrowed hell, didst bring away captivity thence captive us to win. This joyous day, dear Lord, with joy begin, and grant that we for whom thou didst die, being with thy dear blood clean washed from sin, may live for ever in felicity, and that thy love we weighing worthily may likewise love thee for the same again. And for thy sake that all like dear didst buy, with love may one another entertain. So let us love, dear love, like as we ought. Love is the lesson which the Lord us taught. Sonnet 69 The famous warriors of the antique world used trophies to erect in stately wise in which they would the records have enrolled of their great deeds and valorous emprise. What trophy then shall I most fit devise, in which I may record the memory of my love's conquest, peerless beauty's prize, adorned with honor, love, and chastity? Even this verse, vowed to eternity, shall be thereof immortal monument, and tell her praise to all posterity that may admire such world's rare wonderment. The happy purchase of my glorious spoil, gotten at last with labor and long toil. End of section 23 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Section 24 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets 70, 71, and 72. Sonnet 70. Fresh spring, the herald of love's mighty king, in whose coat armor richly are displayed all sorts of flowers, the which on earth do spring in goodly colors gloriously arrayed. Go to my love, where she is careless laid, yet in her winter's bower not well awake. Tell her the joyous time will not be stayed unless she do him by the forelock take. Bid her therefore herself soon ready make to wait on love amongst his lovely crew where every one that misseth then her make shall be by him immersed with penance due. Make haste, therefore, sweet love, whilst it is prime, for none can call again the passed time. Sonnet 71 I joy to see how in your drawn work yourself unto the bee ye do compare, and me unto the spider that doth lurk in close await 
to catch her unaware right so yourself were caught in cunning snare of a dear foe and thralled to his love in whose straight bands ye now captived are so firmly that ye never may remove but as your work is woven all above with woodbine flowers and fragrant eglantine so sweet your prison you in time shall prove with many dear delights bedecked fine and all thenceforth eternal peace shall see between the spider and the gentle bee sonnet seventy two oft when my spirit doth spread her bolder wings and mind to mount up to the purest sky it down is weighed with thought of earthly things and clogged with burden of mortality where when that sovereign beauty it doth spy resembling heaven's glory in her light drawn with sweet pleasure's bait it back doth fly and unto heaven forgets her former flight there my frail fancy fed with full delight doth bathe in bliss and mantleth most at ease ne'er thinks of other heaven but how it might her heart's desire with most contentment please heart need not with none other happiness but here on earth to have such heaven's bliss End of section 24 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Section 25 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets 73, 74, and 75. Sonnet 73 Being myself captived here in care, My heart, whom none with servile bands can tie, But the fair tresses of your golden hair, Breaking his prison, forth to you doth fly, Like as a bird that in one's hand doth spy Desired food, to it doth make his flight. Even so my heart, that won't on your fair eye to feed his fill, flies back unto your sight. Do you him take, and in your bosom bright, gently encage, that he may be your thrall? Perhaps he there may learn with rare delight to sing your name and praises over all, that it hereafter may you not repent him lodging in your bosom to have lent. Sonnet 74 Most happy letters framed by skilful trade, With which that happy name was first defined, The which three times thrice happy hath me made, With gifts of body, fortune, and of mind. The first my being to me gave by kind, From mother's womb derived by due descent, the second is my sovereign queen most kind, That honor and large riches to me lent. The third, my love, my life's last ornament, By whom my spirit out of dust was raised, To speak her praise and glory excellent Of all alive most worthy to be praised. Ye three Elizabeths forever live, that three such graces did unto me give. Sonnet 75 One day I wrote her name upon the strand, but came the waves and washed it away. Again I wrote it with a second hand, but came the tide and made my pains his prey. Vain man, said she, that doest in vain essay immortal things so to immortalize. For I myself shall like to this decay, and eke my name be wiped out likewise. 
Not so, quod I, let baser things devise to die in dust, but you shall live by fame. My verse, your virtues rare, shall eternize, and in the heavens write your glorious name, where, when as death shall all the world subdue, our love shall live, and later life renew. End of section 25 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Section 26 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets 76, 77, and 78. Sonnet 76. Fair bosom fraught with virtue's richest treasure, the nest of love, the lodging of delight, the bower of bliss, the paradise of pleasure, the sacred harbor of that heavenly sprite. How was I ravished with your lovely sight, and my frail thoughts too rashly led astray? whilst diving deep through amorous insight on the sweet spoil of beauty they did pray and twixt her paps like early fruit in may whose harvest seemed to hasten now apace they loosely did their wanton wings display and there to rest themselves did boldly place sweet thoughts i envy your so happy rest which oft i wished yet never was so blessed sonnet seventy seven was it a dream or did i see it plain a goodly table of pure ivory all spread with junkets fit to entertain the greatest prince with pompous royalty mongst which there in a silver dish did lie two golden apples of unvalued price far passing those which hercules came by or those which atalanta did entice exceeding sweet yet void of sinful vice that many sought yet none could ever taste sweet fruit of pleasure brought from paradise by love himself and in his garden placed her breast that table was so richly spread by thoughts the guests which would thereon have fed sonnet seventy eight lacking my love i go from place to place like a young fawn that late hath lost the hind, and seek each where, where last I saw her face, whose image yet I carry fresh in mind. I seek the fields with her late footing signed, I seek her bower with her late presence decked, yet nor in field nor bower I her can find, yet field and bower are full of her aspect. But when mine eyes I thereunto direct, they idly back return to me again, and when I hope to see their true object, I find myself but fed with fancies vain. Cease then mine eyes to seek herself to see, and let my thoughts behold herself in me. End of section twenty six of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Section 27 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets 79, 80, and 81. Sonnet 79. Men call you fair, and you do credit it, for that yourself ye daily such do see. 
But the true fair, that is the gentle wit and virtuous mind, is much more praised of me. For all the rest, however fair it be, shall turn to naught and lose that glorious hue. But only that is permanent and free from frail corruption that doth flesh ensue. That is true beauty, that doth argue you to be divine and born of heavenly seed, derived from that fair spirit from whom all true and perfect beauty did at first proceed. He only fair, and what he fair hath made. All other fair, like flowers, untimely fade. Sonnet 80 After so long a race as I have run through fairyland, which those six books compile, give leave to rest me being half foredone, and gather to myself new breath a while. Then, as a steed refreshed after toil, out of my prison I will break anew, and stoutly will that second work a soil with strong endeavor and attention due. Till then, give leave to me in pleasant mew to sport my muse and sing my love's sweet praise, the contemplation of whose heavenly hue my spirit to an higher pitch will raise. But let her praises yet be low and mean, fit for the handmaid of the fairy queen. Sonnet 81 Fair is my love when her fair golden hairs with the loose wind ye waving chance to mark. Fair when the rose in her red cheeks appears, or in her eyes the fire of love does spark. Fair when her breast, like a rich laden bark with precious merchandise, she forth doth lay. Fair when that cloud of pride, which oft doth dark her goodly light, with smiles she drives away. But fairest she, when so she doth display the gate with pearls and rubies richly dight, through which her words so wise do make their way to bear the message of her gentle sprite. The rest be works of nature's wonderment, but this the work of heart's astonishment. End of section 27 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Section 28 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets 82, 83, and 84. Sonnet 82 Joy of my life, full oft for loving you, I bless my lot that was so lucky placed. But then, the more your own mishap I rue, that are so much by so mean love embased. For had the equal heavens so much you graced in this as in the rest, ye might invent some heavenly wit, whose verse could have enchased your glorious name in golden monument. But since ye deigned so goodly to relent to me your thrall, in whom is little worth, that little that I am shall all be spent in setting your immortal praises forth, whose lofty argument uplifting me shall lift you up unto an high degree. Sonnet 83 My hungry eyes through greedy covet eyes still to behold the object of their pain with no contentment can themselves suffice, but having pine, and having not complain. For lacking it they cannot life sustain, and seeing it 
they gaze on it the more in their amazement like narcissus vain whose eyes him starved so plenty makes me poor yet are mine eyes so filled with the store of that fair sight that nothing else they brook but loathe the things which they did like before and can no more endure on them to look all this world's glory seemeth vain to me and all their shows but shadows saving she sonnet eighty four let not one spark of filthy lustful fire break out that may her sacred peace molest ne'er one light glance of sensual desire attempt to work her gentle mind's unrest but pure affections bred in spotless breast and modest thoughts breathed from well-tempered sprites go visit her in her bower of rest accompanied with angelic delights there fill yourself with those most joyous sights the which myself could never yet attain but speak no word to her of these sad plights which her too constant stiffness doth constrain only behold her rare perfection and bless your fortune's fair election end of section 28 of amoretti by edmund spencer recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio Section 29 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets 85, 86, and 87. Sonnet 85. The world that cannot deem of worthy things, when I do praise her, say I do but flatter so does the cuckoo when the mavis sings begin his witless note apace to clatter but they that skill not of so heavenly matter all that they know not envy or admire rather than envy let them wonder at her but not to deem of her desert aspire deep in the closet of my parts entire her worth is written with a golden quill that me with heavenly fury doth inspire and my glad mouth with her sweet praises fill which when as fame in her shrill trump shall thunder let the world choose to envy or to wonder sonnet eighty six venomous tongue tipped with vile adder's sting of that self-kind with which the furies fell their snaky heads do comb from which a spring of poisoned words and spiteful speeches well let all the plagues and horrid pains of hell upon thee fall for thine accursed hire that with false forged lies which thou didst tell in my true love did stir up coals of ire the sparks whereof let kindle thine own fire and catching hold on thine own wicked head consume thee quite that didst with guile conspire in my sweet peace such breaches to have bred shame be thy meed and mischief thy reward do to thyself that it for me prepared sonnet eighty seven since i did leave the presence of my love many long weary days i have outworn and many nights that slowly seem to move their sad protract from evening until morn for when as day the heaven doth adorn i wish that night the noyous day would end and when as night hath us of light forlorn i wish that day would shortly reascend thus i the time with expectation spend and feign my grief with changes to beguile that 
further seems his term still to extend and maketh every minute seem a mile so sorrow still doth seem too long to last but joyous hours do fly away too fast end of section 29 of amoretti by edmund spencer recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio Section 30 of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Sonnets 88 and 89, and the untitled concluding poem of Amoretti. Sonnet 88. Since I have lacked the comfort of that light, the which was wont to lead my thoughts astray, I wander as in darkness of the night, afraid of every danger's least dismay. Ne'er aught I see, though in the clearest day, when others gaze upon their shadows vain, but the only image of that heavenly ray, whereof some glance doth in mine eye remain, of which, beholding the idea plain, through contemplation of my purest part, with light thereof i do myself sustain and thereon feed my love a famished heart but with such brightness whilst i fill my mind i starve my body and mine eyes do blind sonnet eighty nine like as the culver on the barred bough sits mourning for the absence of her mate and in her songs sends many a wishful vow for his return that seems to linger late so i alone now left disconsolate mourn to myself the absence of my love and wandering here and there all desolate seek with my plaints to match that mournful dove ne joy of aught that under heaven doth hove can comfort me but her own joyous sight whose sweet aspect both god and man can move in her unspotted pleasance to delight dark is my day while her fair light i miss and dead my life that wants such lively bliss the concluding poem in youth before i waxed old the blind boy venus baby for want of cunning made me bold in bitter hive to grope for honey but when he saw me stung and cry he took his wings and away did fly as diane hunted on a day she chanced to come where cupid lay his quiver by his head one of his shafts she stole away and one of hers did close convey into the other's stead with that love wounded my love's heart but diane beasts with cupid's dart i saw in secret to my dame how little cupid humbly came and said to her all hail my mother but when he saw me laugh for shame his face with bashful blood did flame not knowing venus from the other then never blush cupid quoth i for many have erred in this beauty upon a day as love lay sweetly slumbering all in his mother's lap a gentle bee with his loud trumpet murmuring about him flew by hap whereof when he was wakened with the noise and saw the beast so small what's this quoth he that gives so great a voice that wakens men withal in angry wise he flies about and threatens all with courage stout to whom his mother closely smiling said twixt earnest and twixt game see thou thyself likewise art little made if thou regard the same and yet thou sufferest neither gods in sky nor men in earth to rest but when thou art disposed cruelly their sleep thou dost molest then either change thy cruelty 
or give like leave unto the fly natheless the cruel boy not so content would needs the fly pursue and in his hand with heedless hardiment him caught for to subdue but when on it he hasty hand did lay the bee him stung therefore now out alas he cried and well away i wounded am full sore the fly that i so much did scorn hath hurt me with his little horn unto his mother straight he weeping came and of his grief complained who could not choose but laugh at his fond game though sad to see him pained think now quoth she my son how great the smart of those whom thou dost wound full many thou hast pricked to the heart that pity never found therefore henceforth some pity take when thou dost spoil of lovers make she took him straight full piteously lamenting and wrapped him in her smock she wrapped him softly all the while repenting that he the fly did mock she dressed his wound and it embalmed well with salve of sovereign might and then she bathed him in a dainty well the well of dear delight who would not oft be stung as this to be so bathed in venus bliss the wanton boy was shortly well recured of that his malady but he soon after fresh again inured his former cruelty and since that time he wounded hath myself with his sharp dart of love and now forgets the cruel careless elf his mother's hest to prove so now i languish till he please my pining anguish to appease End of section 30, and also end of Amoretti by Edmund Spencer. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio.